Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the third installment of the Docent Discovery Series. I'm Paul Cars, and I'm an interpretive aide over at the Castro Adobe. This series of webinars is designed for volunteers to learn about natural and cultural histories from our experts within and beyond our park community so that you can become more knowledgeable, agile, and engaged volunteer team. Now, a couple of housekeeping things before we start this evening. Please type any questions into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. If you have general comments or just want to say hi to someone, place those in the chat. We will do our best to answer all of your questions. And at the end of the webinar, a survey will be sent out about the series. We really do appreciate your feedback. And it'll help us to improve our volunteer enrichment in the future. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you Ashley Wemp, who is our state park interpreter at Seacliff State Beach. Ashley? There we go, let's try that again. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ashley, and I'm an interpreter at Seacliff State Beach. And it is my great honor to introduce our speakers for this evening. Um, one of our speakers is Sarah Warden. And Sarah is a marine environmental scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. She works on the department's marine protected area management program. Her MPA journey started at UC Santa Cruz, go slugs, where she earned her bachelor's degree in marine biology and continued as a research specialist monitoring the rocky intertidal habitats across the West Coast as part of the state's MPA monitoring program. Sarah loves applying her skills as a nearshore ecologist and self-proclaimed seaweed nerd to the natural resource management challenges the department tackles every day in California. And our second speaker is Lisa Utal. And Lisa is a marine biologist and science educator who works for NOAA's Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, developing ecosystem-based ocean and coastal science programs. She started her career at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and conducted deep sea research at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute or Ambari. Lisa developed a sanctuary plankton monitoring network program here in California, a long-term temporal and spatial study conducted by community scientists who measure year round phytoplankton, zooplankton and microplastics in our near shore, as well as other oceanographic measurements like salinity and water temperature. And also joining us this evening are Morgan Rector, a plankton monitor within the Monterey Bay, who's going to show us some awesome plankton later on. And then also we have Jane Silberstein, who co-teaches the plankton class at Cabrillo College and has taught interpretation at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Sarah. Thank you so much, Ashley. Can everybody hear me okay? Or at least the panelists. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna attempt to share my screen here. You never know how this is gonna go on Zoom. Okay, there we go. So thanks so much for that introduction, Ashley. Um, as Ashley mentioned, I work for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, which is the state agency that's essentially in charge with managing all of the natural resources in the state of California. So as you can imagine, we partner very closely with state parks on a lot of projects and a lot of natural resource challenges, including one that I'm gonna tell you about tonight. So I work for the MTA management program at the state, and I'm gonna just give you a brief introduction about our very special marine protected area network here in California, sort of where we are now and next steps with network management and of course the connection with state parks. So really quickly before I dive in, um, I just want to kind of 
define what marine protected areas are because there are a lot of different definition, definitions across the globe, kind of depending on where you're coming from. But the state marine protected areas in California, we define those as discrete geographic marine or estuarine areas seaward of the mean high tide line. So basically anything below the high tide line um, to about zero to three nautical miles out, which is our state waters. Um, so if that's where the MPAs fall. And in many places, if you've heard about marine protected areas, um, in some places they're put in place to really protect fish species. In some places they're put into place to promote tourism. But here in California, we have our marine protected areas specifically to protect marine life, marine habitats, and cultural resources. So how did our MPAs came, come about? Well, essentially, um, and this is pretty novel to California, it was a law that got passed that told the state that we had to do this. And that law was called the Marine Life Protection Act, which passed in the 1999. And I'll also call it the MLPA. So sorry about all the acronyms or state agency folks, we use them a lot, but the MLPA stands for Marine Life Protection Act. So when the, when the law got passed, it required the redesign and expansion of what was then kind of this piecemeal unorganized um, system of marine protected areas. The law required that we take a science-based stakeholder driven approach to design an ecologically connected network. And when I say that here for us, that means all of the adult fish and critters living out in the ocean are sending their babies out elsewhere. So the babies move from MPA to MPA, they can move from MPA to outside MPAs, and this is kind of the broad definition of ecological connectivity. But there's also a lot of other ways that the MPA is connected, of course. Um, as I mentioned before, this applies to state water zero to three nautical miles offshore. And the law also gave the California Department of Fish and Wildlife lead managing um, responsibilities and our commission, the California Fish and Game Commission authority to adopt all the MPAs and um, adopt the regulations surrounding the MPAs. So these are kind of the six foundational goals that are listed in the MLPA. Um, one other really novel thing about this piece of legislation is that prior to then, a lot of the laws and kind of things that, that dictate how we manage, manage resources in California really focused on single species, especially in the marine realm. A lot of the laws had to do with um, managing fisheries, single fish species, bringing back healthy fisheries, but the Marine Life Protection Act really took this ecosystem-based point of view. Um, so these aren't word for word what the, what the goals are, but as you can see, the themes throughout are really protecting the biodiversity of our amazing habitats and species, conserving and rebuilding some of those fish populations. And then there's these human dimension elements. So enhancing recreation and science, protecting the cultural elements of our network. Um, of course, enforcement and compliance is very important. And sixth, but definitely not least, is that we are actually mandated to design and manage this as a connected network. And basically California is really a pioneer in this, in, in the entire world. A lot of nations now are looking to us because of this piece of legislation, legislation and how we've designed our network. So it's pretty exciting. So once the MLPA passed and um, the department kind of sat, sat back and said, wow, we, <laughs> this is a big task. How are we gonna do this? So uh, the first approach was really to kind of implement these MPAs by region. Uh, many of you know, when you go from Northern California to Southern California, populations change, values change, the population of California is very different depending on where you are. So we took this regional um, approach to implementing the MTAs. So first was up with Central Coast, which of course is where Santa Cruz falls. Um, that stretches from Pigeon Point to Point Conception and the MTA implementation completed here in 2007. Second was the North Central Coast. This stretch from Alder Creek, which is just north of Point Arena and comes down to Pigeon Point. And that section was completed in 2010. Next up was the South Coast, uh, which goes from Point Conception down to the US-Mexico border in 2012. And at the end of 2012, the North Coast wraps up and that stretches from Alder Creek up to the Oregon and California border. So once implementation was complete, we have a network of 124 MPAs in California. Um, this 
graph here kind of shows you the breakdown of the different designations. I'm not going to get into the weeds on this, but the big take home message, the red you see is our state marine reserves. These are no take MPAs. So you can't take anything out of them, including cultural geology, rocks, shells, anything. Um, and we kind of consider this the backbone of the MPA network. So 9% of our MPAs are actually no take marine reserves. And then the rest kind of fall under this mix of designations that allow certain types of take depending on sort of the human uses and other needs and cultural needs in the areas. 16% um, of our state waters are now protected in state marine protected areas. And prior to the MLPA, there was only about, I think about 3%. And then just a really fun fact about state parks is that 35 of these MPAs are actually adjacent to 42 state parks. So we do a lot of kind of overlapping jurisdiction and management around these um, overlapping MPAs. So once the program was, or once the network was put in place, we had to kind of move forward with how we were gonna manage the network. So we manage it using the MPA management program, which has four focal areas. And these focal areas really rose to the top from kind of the science of MPAs as we were figuring things out. So a lot of the literature and other places where there are MPAs in the world hold out these kind of four pillars as things that you really need to put in place to have a successful MPA. So those are outreach and education, research and monitoring, enforcement and compliance, and policy and permitting. So I'm just going to give you like a few examples now of some of the activities that we do under each of these focal areas as part of managing the network. So first up is outreach and education. Um, we're actually really excited. The department just launched this new digital tool called the Ocean Sport Fishing Web Map. Um, and it's an online tool kind of in response to a lot of our stakeholders not being able to find regulations very easily or when they're actually out in the field trying to like figure out where they are in respect to an MPA. So, this app can actually show you your location um, close to or within an MPA. It lists out the regulations, the fishing regulations, and all kinds of stuff like that. So we're excited that um, this has been launched. You can connect to it from our website. Um, and the one thing is, is it does require cell service. So if you are out in a remote area, I know a lot of the MPA is kind of in between Santa Cruz and Pasadena Bay. You don't get great reception. It doesn't work, um, but we're kind of working on other options to get out there, but still it's a great, great tool. Um, and of course, I mentioned we work really closely with, with parks, the state parks on a lot of the outreach and education that we do around MPA. So, so the state parks runs um, the PORT program, which is Parks Online Resources for Teachers and Students. And they have MPA focused programs that they do through that for um, all of the school age children in California. And I think they expanded it through COVID. So anybody could get access, which is really cool. And Ashley can correct me if that's wrong later. Um, but there is a local courts program at one of the Santa Cruz MPAs out of Año Nuevo that teaches, of course, about marine mammals. Um, and then we rely heavily on all of you, the docents and the people out there who are passionate about educating people about the wonderful natural resources that we have in California. So I know the docent programs out of Big Basin State Park at Rancho Del Oso, um, on Nuevo, and Natural Bridges all do MPA related outreach. Um, and I'm sure there are many, many others. So thank you for all the hard work you do. And then again, the department produces a lot of MPA outreach and education materials to get passed out, brochures, all that kind of stuff. And you can find out more about that, that on our website. So next up is research and monitoring. Um, we do have a very robust research and monitoring program in the state and it's statewide. Uh, it got implemented in two phases. So the first phase was baseline monitoring, which characterized the conditions at the time of implementation across all those regions. So we had scientists going out right after the MPAs were put in place to collect data on all in all the key habitats on all of the species, all of the species that, that are important to us for managing. So kelp forest, rocky inner tidal, sandy beach, there's a whole bunch of key habitats that the MPAs protect that were targeted by this research. And now we've moved into long-term monitoring, which will continue into the future. So the long-term monitoring will provide us with these sort of future assessments to help us evaluate the network performance, at least the ecological goals in particular, 
when we compare that to the baseline monitoring. And I'm gonna give some examples of some of the local monitoring that's going on a little bit later in the talk here. So of course, MPAs wouldn't really work if people don't follow the rules and regulations and there are not well enforced. So we work really, really closely with our law enforcement division and I know a lot of the folks out there in the public, generally the interactions that they have with our department staff are through our wildlife officers or wardens, because um, they're out there in the field, you know, patrolling all the time. So there's a few tools that they really use to help us enforce the MPAs. Um, most recently, we actually got 40 dedicated officers to patrol solely marine ecosystems. So prior to this happening, all of our LED folks were out there working terrestrial, working marine, just being renaissance people. But now we have 40 dedicated officers that just do marine. So that was a really big deal. Um, they do have an enforcement boat fleet. There's a local one out of Santa Cruz. I believe they're docked in Moss Landing. So you may see them um, out in patrol in the water. And we're getting two new vessels really soon, which is exciting. I'm not sure where they're gonna be located, but just building capacity within our enforcement division is an exciting thing. And then of course, they rely very heavily on allied agency partnerships, especially those within state parks and the enforcement officers at state parks to help with that. And then one question I often get from the public is, you know, if we're out there and we see a violation, how can we help? Um, so the department does have a line that you can call called CalTIP, and I've provided the number down here. You can also text so this can be an NPA violation, this can be any marine violation, any violation that you see you can call or that you think you see you can call CalTIP. And it's important to get as much information to provide the LED officer that you can about location, license plate, details on what you think the violation might be. That really helps them out to build a case in the end um, and can help them find you know, where the violation is really going on. Um, and you know, again, if you're in a place that doesn't have great cell service and are seeing a violation, that's okay. You can still call after the fact and report it because that information is still very usable and helpful to our law enforcement officers. And last but not least, we have policy and permitting. So within the MPA program, we deal mostly with the scientific collecting permit program. So anytime anybody wants to do research or education or anything like that out in an MPA, they have to apply for a scientific collecting permit or anywhere outside of MPAs too. They have to apply for this permit. And you know, one of the goals in the, in the MLPA is to promote research, but we wanna be careful about how much research and specifically manipulative research is going on out there in the marine ecosystem and in our MPA. So our permitting program actually uses a tool called the ecological assessment tool, which helps them look at kind of thresholds and really helps minimize the impact of research activities while still allowing that important work to go on. And then we work really closely with um, other partner agencies on a lot of the policy calls that we have to make across the network. So I'm just gonna wrap up this broad overview um, with something really exciting that's coming up. So as a part of our mandate, we are actually mandated to take a, a very broad comprehensive review of the MPA management program and the network to the Fish and Game Commission and all of you to the people of California every 10 years. So as I mentioned earlier, the implementation of the network wrapped up in 2012. So we're coming up on that first 10 year cycle at the end of 2022. So I'm just gonna give you a broad overview of some of the components that we're working on to put into this report. Um, and that's what I'm working on a lot these days. So I'm pretty excited about it. So essentially, we're going to be pulling together this report using a lot of the research and monitoring data that I mentioned. Of course, that's going to really help us evaluate the network ecologically. We're going to be working very closely with our California Native American tribal governments. Of course, stakeholder input, that's all of you guys. So I'm gonna speak a little bit at the end of the presentation about how you can get more involved, but we definitely want your voice to be heard. These are your MPAs as Californians. So we'll be working really closely with, with all of our stakeholders. Of course, we'll be working a lot internally. We'll be coordinating with our fisheries projects and our law enforcement division within CDFW. 
We have a couple science advisory team working groups that are really helping us look at climate change resilience and how to manage the MTA network with the future of climate change and also kind of prioritizing monitoring um, questions and things to tackle moving forward after this big review. And of course, we're not gonna know anything, everything. We are gonna know something, <laughs> but we're not gonna know everything. Um, so we are gonna be taking like the gaps of knowledge and additional questions we can ask, you know, past the review. And um, all of this will kind of lead to helping us form our future monitoring strategies and then adaptive management is really at the root of everything we'll do. So we wanna also stress that um, although the commission is a regulatory body, this is an informational update to them. We are not expecting them to take any action or make any changes to the MTA network at the time of the review, um, but they could ask the department to actually implement some of the adaptive management recommendations that we're taking for them. Okay, so now I'm going to move into the fun part and talk about your local MTAs in the Santa Cruz area. And I'm, I'm going to start from the north to the south. Um, so Año Nuevo is kind of the furthest northern MTA at the Santa Cruz County line. It is a state marine reserve, and I have a picture here on the map. It's in red. Um, Año borders two state parks, actually. The state marine reserve borders both Año Nuevo State Park and Big Basin State Park down near Waddell Creek. Um, it is an SMR, so there's no take of natural resources whatsoever in Año Nuevo. It protects about 11.14 square miles of coastal habitat. And this MPA was actually designed specifically to protect the, the unique kelp forest habitat that's there. So this section of coast in the central coast is kind of the only place in the state where both bull kelp and mac the giant kelp macrocystis coexist. So it's kind of an interesting kelp forest ecosystem. So the species likely to benefit here and that are very common in Año Nuevo are a lot of the beautiful rockfish species that you see out there. And then of course the big kelp. Um, so the monitoring groups that target Año Nuevo are the Rocky Intertidal, Sandy Beach surveys, there are hook and line surveys out there. So we have a citizen science group that goes out um, and does catch and release of rockfish. And that's where I've been on those boats and it's really fun. There's a lot of, of, of cool fish out there. And then um, the remotely operated vehicle or ROV surveys happen out there. And you may be wondering, so this, this MPA was designed specifically to protect kelp forests. So why isn't there kelp forest monitoring going on out there? Well, this guy kind of keeps the divers from wanting to get in the water and for it being safe for them. So I've even seen one patrolling out there when I've been on the hook and line surveys, which is really exciting, um, but it keeps divers out of the water while they're looking for their favorite, favorite snack, elephant seal snacks. So next up is Greyhound Rock State Marine Conservation Area. This um, MPA is directly south and actually shares a border with Año Nuevo State Marine Reserve. Um, and this is actually a design feature that we call paired MPAs in the network. So this essentially allows us to um, maximize the area protected while also kind of balancing the different uses that might happen there. So Greyhound was a very popular place for local recreational fishermen to go out and do hook and line. Um, from shore, so that was taken into account when we were designing the network. So as I mentioned, it's an SMCA, so there is some take allowed. However, no intertidal take is allowed and most take of invertebrates is prohibited. Um, the SMCA, and you can go on our online to check out all of the regulations because the SMCAs all have very different regulations. Um, Greyhound protects about 12 square miles of coastal habitat. Uh, specifically the kelp forest and a lot of the rocky intertidal habitat. So the species likely to benefit are going to see things that utilize the kelp forest as well as invertebrate communities that are out there. And the monitoring happening in Greyhound State Marine Conservation Area is in the rocky intertidal and sandy beach habitat. All right, so next up is kind of your close, it is your closest MTA to Santa Cruz, Natural Bridges State Marine Reserve, which directly borders, again, two state parks the Wilder Ranch State Park and Natural Bridges State Beach. Um, it's a very long, skinny MPA, as you can see here by the map. It is a state marine reserve, so there's no take of any natural resources whatsoever. And it is a small MPA. It only protects about 
0.25 square miles of coastal habitat, but you can tell by its shape that it was designed specifically to protect those intertidal and soft bottom intertidal habitats. So the species likely to benefit here are going to be those species that utilize those habitats, um, like sea stars, mussels, clams in the soft bottom, things like that. Um, and the monitoring here naturally is the rocky intertidal and sandy beach. And then I wanted to include one more MTA that doesn't necessarily fall within Santa Cruz County lines, but as you're kind of looking out on the Monterey Bay out into the sanctuary, there's a state, there's a couple state MPAs out there. And um, the one closest to Santa Cruz is Oak Hill Canyon State Marine Conservation Area. And this MPA is unique because it's it doesn't, there's not very many MPAs in the network that are offshore that don't surround offshore islands or rocks. Um, I think there's only a few. So this is a pretty unique MPA. And as I mentioned, there is some take allowed in this MPA, but it was specifically designed to protect those submarine canyons out in the Monterey Bay, which Lisa may be touching on in her talk, hopefully, because they're so cool. Um, it protects about 22.97 nine seven square miles of offshore deep habitat so the species likely to benefit here are going to be those benthic species the species that live down on the canyon walls and down on the on the ocean floor um, and the only monitoring that goes on out there because it's the targeted habitat is the rov monitoring and i highly recommend that you go to our youtube page and check out we have a lot of rov video posted there from the monitoring trip including specifically for Oak Hill Canyon, and you can see all kinds of cool deep dwelling creatures that just look like aliens. It's pretty neat. So if you do want to get more involved in, in your MPA network and your local MPAs, um, I provided a few links here that you can check out. And I'm actually going to send Ashley a document um, after this that has these links that she can send out to all of you. Um, but I highly, highly recommend that um, if you're interested to sign up for our marine management blog, you'll get a lot of information about um, all of the projects that CDFW works on, but the MPA project does put out Exploring California's MPAs blogs that will feature MPAs. Um, and it's just a great resource to stay up to date also on the review that I spoke of that's coming up. Um, and if you're super interested in getting involved, the MPA Collaborative Network is also a fantastic resource. So I think Lisa's gonna touch on that as well, she's the co-chair of, of your local um, collaborative out of Santa Cruz County. And there's also San Mateo County and Monterey County have collaboratives. There's collaboratives all up and down the state. Um, so there's more information about that here. And then if you haven't, check out the Fish and Game Commission meetings because that's always a good way to kind of hear what's going on with our natural resources in California. Um, so with that, I think that's my last slide. So again, just thanks to State Park for inviting me to speak with all of you tonight. Here's my contact info, and you're welcome to reach out um, anytime. And I think if I have time for questions, I'll also be hanging out a little bit later if other questions come up. So um, I'll pass it back to Ashley. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. We have a few questions. And our first question is, what is manipulative research? So sometimes, that's a great question. I, I put my science hat on there for a minute <laughs> and kind of use some jargon. Um, so sometimes a lot of science will go out there and they're not necessarily like observing something. They might need to like take something back to the lab or kind of set up an experiment out in the habitat that they're looking at. So sometimes that means like clearing a few species here and there, you know, just there's, there's all kinds of ways you can do it. So we try to keep that to a minimum, especially in our MPAs, um, just because we don't want, you know, there's a lot of research um, interest in our MPAs. So one person going out there to do something like that really isn't that big of a deal. But when you have a lot of researchers going to the same MPA, you just want to make sure that they're not taking too much or um, putting too many experiments out there. So that's what I mean by manipulative research. And along those same lines, um, there's another question about does catch and release of rockfish damage the fish? Yeah, so um, I was lucky enough to actually get trained up a science crew to go out with that project. And I can tell you that 
they have done put in so much research and so much care in making sure the fish get back into the water without getting any damage. And they have very, very, very low mortality rates or death rates, basically. So the fish are only on board, we time it, the fish are only on board for um, less than five minutes and you just get measurements and then gently release them. And then they use barbless hooks. They, they're to prevent barotrauma. They only fish down to a certain depth. So there's a lot of different ways that um, they've taken into account to reduce, to reduce that exact thing hurting the fish. So it's, it's a very effective project. And I can say that firsthand because I've been out with them as science crew. And it's called the California Collaborative fisheries research program um, and they started at Moss Landing so they have all of their protocols and everything posted on their website so you can go check that out to get more details. And there's one more question specific to Wilder Ranch. Um, are the cliffs going to be permanently closed to fishing? So I, that's a good question for our law enforcement division, because I would have to check and see exactly where the boundary is. So I'm not sure if that Natural Bridges State Marine Reserve extends the entire length of Wilder Ranch. So if you're outside of the MPA and you're not on private property or breaking any fishing regulations and have a license and all that stuff, I don't think the department's planning on making any closures based on the marine protected area. My guess is that the boundary doesn't cover the entirety of Wilder. Sarah, there was a question that came in about um, DDT and barrels of DDT in Southern California that might be leaking. And how are we managing responsibility for those uh, potential leaks? Yeah, so that's a great question. I have not been super involved as the department representative who can speak to that, but I can put an email where you can send that question to the department and we can get you a solid answer. Um, so I'll put that in the chat and just make sure whoever asked that question gets that email and they can send it and we'll, um, I'll put you in touch with the right representative who can help you with that. Great, and that seems to be all of the questions that we have right now. Okay, great. And I'll, I'm gonna stick around, so if more come up, I'll be here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sarah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, can every, everyone hear me okay? Um, I wanna thank Ashley and Sarah. It's so great to be here. Um, I'm Lisa Utall and I'm with Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and I was as Sarah was talking I realized that Sarah could just we could put Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary in place of MPAs and it would be uh, the same kind of mission the same kind of vision the same kind of research and resource protection that we do at the sanctuary. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about the sanctuary first. And then we're going to move into talking about the plankton and doing a little tour of a drop of water today that was pulled out of the Monterey Bay. Um, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is part of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, NOAA is, a lot of people are familiar with NOAA because they think of the National Weather Service or they think of the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, we are part of National um, Oceanic Ocean Sur 
National Ocean Services, and we fall below that particular um, sector of NOAA. Um, and our national marine sanctuaries are really unique because they're recognized, they're congressionally recognized um, for a variety of ecosystem qualities. It may be the ecology, it may be that it's just such a rich, diverse area. It may be because due to the maritime and cultural history. Um, here in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, we have over three, 400, we've cataloged 400 shipwrecks and plane wrecks. It may be because we're just a great place to recreate, or it may be the cultural history that's here, which as many of you know, is incredibly rich in terms of the fishing communities and fishing. We do ecosystem protection, just like the state MPAs. Um, we serve as a trustee for the marine sanctuaries to protect their natural and cultural resources. We balance um, the use of it by humans and how we balance that with enjoyment in long-term conservation. One of the big priorities nationally is really the blue economy. What are those ecosystem services? What does the ocean bring to us? What does it give to us? You can't really evaluate you know, the fact that plankton photosynthesizes and creates more than 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. How do you evaluate that? How do you factor that in to the value of these protected areas? Also, we are really, um, we work with local communities. We really want to work with local coastal economies to balance what's going on to, to promote sustainability and healthy ecosystems. And then finally, big thing that we do at the sanctuary is um, through talking about the sanctuary, raising awareness and really understanding and promoting stewardship of the marine environment. So I'm really excited to talk about this because we have sanctuaries across the United States, even in Hawaii and in American Samoa. Um, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary was the largest sanctuary up until they expanded uh, Fatitelli Bay, American Samoa, which became 35,000 square miles of protected area. All of these different sanctuaries, please notice that we have sanctuaries in the freshwater areas too. So we have a couple that are online. Because these are congressionally approved, Typically what happens with sanctuaries is as a president is leaving office, they usually will take advantage of that and we designate our san sanctuaries. Our national sanctuary, here it is here, you can see this black line, it encompasses 6,000 square miles of uh, ocean water. And like the state MPAs, we go from high mean tide down. Um, we have this map, you can see some of the state MPAs in here as well, um, to show you we're about 6,000 square miles. So we're a really vast area. We average about 35, 30 miles offshore, and our shoreline length is 276 miles going down from the Gulf of the Farallons National Marine Sanctuary down to San Simeon. Our um, deepest point is the Davidson Seamount, which is an underwater extinct volcano. And at the sanctuary, like the state MPAs, we do ecosystem-based management. We do research. We do research at the Davidson Seamount. We do research in the intertidal. Um, we have lots of scuba diving going on. We just acquired a new boat. Um, it's coming tomorrow. We're really excited about it. Um, it's called Tegula, after the turban snail. And we do resource protection. We've been working on the fronts of uh, working upstream with water quality folks, um, working with the farmers to ensure that pollution doesn't make its way into the sanctuary. And then finally, we do a lot and lot of education um, through our two visitor centers, one located in San Simeon 
and one located in Santa Cruz at the head of the wharf, the Sanctuary Exploration Center. And that education, I, I call it science-based science -based education. Um, and that science-based education includes stewardship. So really it's educating people about that the sanctuary is there and not just that it's there and it's a place, but educating people about how what they can do in their own lives to help protect such a big ecosystem. And of course, like the state MPAs, we have a lot of prohibited activities and regulations and laws. And as you know, in Santa Cruz, um, thanks to Save Our Shores, in the early mid early 70s, there was a huge effort to prevent offshore oil drilling. And that was sort of the genesis of getting Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary designated. It wasn't until 1992 that the sanctuary was designated. But through that, the federal law says that you can't discharge or deposit materials into the sanctuary. You can't drill or dredge or alter and you can't take any marine mammals, sea turtles, or seabirds. We also have uh, aircraft zones that go above the sanctuary where you can fly and where you can't fly. And that was put in place to protect uh, seabirds that nest on the rocks, um, to protect those organisms that are in the near shore. We actually have motorized personal watercraft zones that are designated so if you want to take a jet ski um, offshore, you have to go on average a quarter mile offshore because of such significant wildlife in the nearshore environment, it's really important that um, folks are aware and we were really careful to ensure that, you know, these watercraft couldn't get out into the water um, and, you know, be zooming around otters or, um, flushing birds or other marine mammals. You can't attract white sharks regardless of their intent. And so I, I like that regardless of the intent. So, so you can't go out. There was years ago, actually up north, um, a cage where people, they went out and they used to attract white sharks. That was quickly put to a stop. And again, you can't remove or move or injure or possess any historical resources. And then one of the biggest things that I think was huge was the sanctuary pushed container ship routes offshore and separated the northbound from the southbound because one of the biggest risks was going to be um, oil spills from container ships passing along our shore. They separated the ingoing and outgoing um, ships. And I think that did a lot for the potential of having some kind of um, collision and therefore an oil spill that could decimate this pop these populations. I want to pull back for a minute now, um, sort of take you back out to the earth. If we zoom back out and look at our ocean, the ocean is 71% of the Earth's surface. There's more than 326 million trillion gallons of water on Earth, and less than 3% of all this water is fresh water. And of that amount, more than two thirds is locked up in an ice caps and glaciers. In the top 200 meters of our world's ocean, there's phytoplankton, there's zooplankton. And if we all just take a minute, I can't see you guys, but I'm going to take a big breath. We can thank that phytoplankton in the top 200 meters of our water because we can thank it for every other breath we take. And not just us as humans, but those other breathing organisms, we get every other breath from the phytoplankton in that top 200 meters. Also, remember phytoplankton photosynthesizes. So it is pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and pulling all that carbon dioxide that we, the ocean is a big carbon sink 
for the most important stuff that we need to get out of the atmosphere, um, including carbon dioxide. This is a video of an ROV going down into the Monterey Submarine Canyon. And you're seeing all these, it's called marine snow. And this is all flocculent material that's incredibly, um, it's just, it's called marine snow. And marine snow is based on, it's made up of zooplankton, phytoplankton, and a lot of poop. All of this stuff is taking and pulling carbon and things out of the atmosphere and sinking down to the bottom. And keep in mind too, in our ocean, that every day what's happening across the world ocean is this green, this is a cross section, and it's actually a layer of organisms that are picked up by sonar moving up and down in the water column every day. Why is that significant? These organisms come up and they're grabbing plankton and going down. They're diurnally migrating and they're eating food. Um, I did my research at Ambari and when I did my research years ago, we went, we were able because of the near shore deep submarine canyon in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary to go this one spot. And in this one spot, we were able to take the ROV down and there was this organism, Peobius. And Peobius was just one of thousands and thousands and millions of organisms that are in the largest habitat on earth. And that habitat is the midwater. Peobius was sitting there with its tentacles splayed out and just loving eating all that marine snow floating down. I was looking at their diet and monitoring it over the course of the year, two years. And what I found in their diet was absolutely fecal pellets, phytoplankton, and zooplankton. What I'm trying to tell you is that they act as a very important remineralization of all that marine snow and breaking down that carbon and sinking it down to the bottom. And that's all that phytoplankton and zooplankton that we're going to look at today. Why is this important? I would wager, I go out on a limb, and I would say arguably phytoplankton is the most important organism on Earth, at least in the ocean, because it there's so much we have to thank it for. All these different organisms come and that, create that food web. It is why the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is so incredible. It is so biodiverse. And it's diverse because that phytoplankton gets eaten by that zooplankton. That zooplankton then gets eaten by the sardines. And then the salmon eat the sardines. And then the harbor seals and the sharks come in to eat each other <laughs> or the, eat the harbor seals. And then, of course, for us, we benefit so much from such incredible seafood that comes from our ocean. So this also, you know, plankton, we have a lot to thank it for. We have, this is Rio, I think Rio Del Mar, this is bioluminescence that happened on our coast because of plankton. This is the Monterey Formation, which is basically where uh, plankton has gone down and been compressed over the years. And I threw this in here because we can't, possibly understand how important phytoplankton is because of now on land they're actually building houses and apartment buildings and things like this that absorb carbon because they're trying to pull the pollution out of their atmosphere because there aren't enough trees and they're trying to get trying to pull it out so the we have a lot to thank plankton for and i always thank plankton on a regular basis for Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which is one of, is probably, we call it the Serengeti of the sea. Because plankton produces the oxygen for one of two breaths that we breathe. Even the smell, when you go down to the ocean and you take a sniff of the ocean, I always say, oh, I love that ocean smell. That's really, that's phytoplankton. 
And even animals use that scent to find their food, like albatrosses. We, this plankton makes clouds, and uh, that clouds are keeping us cooler. Plankton sequesters the carbon and sings it, sinks it down to the bottom of the ocean as marine snow. And really most importantly is that Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is this incredible place to do research and to recreate and those services that it brings are so critical to our marine protected areas. So we at the sanctuary are trying to protect it in terms of sustainability for future generations. Um, I'm just gonna quickly go through here. I can see that we're running out of time and we still wanna look at plankton. We are a very productive environment here. We have upwelling and that's what causes. We are in this really great time. We want to show plankton to you tonight because the, the upwelled cool water stimulates plankton growth. And so we get different things here during different times of year. And this time of year, Morgan and Jane are going to show you in just a second how incredible the plankton can be during this time of year. And that's these cool waters that stimulate uh, growth of the phytoplankton and so on. Finally, the diversity here in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary due to plankton. Um, you know, I, I just can't even express how great it is, which allows us to have incredible wildlife activities, incredible research activities. And you know that because there's over 50 research and educational institutions. And then there's the state parks and then there's MPAs all working together to protect it. So I'd like to just quickly zip over this because we're running out of time. I'd like to take a tour of plankton and I'd like to introduce uh, Morgan and Jane who are going to go ahead and share their screen. Hi everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so I got a sample from Monterey here today and I'm gonna be showing it to you, but before I project it, just wanna give you an idea. Okay, whoops, sorry. So when we pull plankton out of the water, it has this kind of orange or um, tan, orangey tannish color. Um, that usually means there's a lot of biodiversity and I'm gonna be putting one drop on a slide on the microscope for you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get right to all the exciting stuff. Okay. Woo. Woo, a polychaete. Excellent. That's a, uh, a segmented worm that is very abundant and a really important uh, animal in the whole food web. You know, this is the larval stage of it. You can see, oh, and a little baby barnacle is making its way towards the head of the worm, but the worm doesn't like it, so it's shaking it off. <laughs> if you feel like doing a little dance, you can dance with the And you can see a, a smaller one. Oh, cool. On the, <laughs> on the, oh, it just zipped away. So we're seeing three different types of copepods. So the bright red eye and then the yellow, these are one of the most numerous animals uh, on planet Earth. The tintinids, a little bit smaller, more numerous, and then the copepods. And the copepods are like the cows grazing on the fields of phytoplankton. Okay, let's see. You have a great sample, Morgan. Oh, hey. and look at that beautiful fecal pellet to the right. That's a very long fecal pellet. Now, I know this is an appro maybe not appropriate, but I didn't mention, but Peobius, the deep sea organism that live below 200 meters and above the bottom actually had, during this time of year in May, fecal pellets packing its gut from mouth to anus. Now, fecal pellets are important because you gotta imagine all these animals are remineralizing. They're eating what's floating down in the marine snow, breaking it down and remineralizing, meaning they're breaking down that carbon and shooting it down to the bottom 
So that the ocean is a carbon sink. The, the barnacle important. that just zipped by, if you see it again, just look in its gut. You can look and see what it's been eating. And you can see on this uh, polygate or worm that it has eaten a lot of golden algae. Yeah. That, uh, you can look right in its tummy. And this little baby barnacle, you know, has the bright cyclops, the red eye, and you can see it doing the breaststroke as it moves through the water. And so, then another polychaete that just went by that is um, a little bit younger in the life cycle. It has long um, bristles that help it move through. And you'll notice a lot of these animals are transparent. They have a lot of little appendages that are long and thin to help keep them in the water column. Yeah, I'm Jane, that, that's great. She's, she's talking about most of the zooplankton here. And if you saw behind those zooplankton, you saw all these little golden single cells. Here, this is a dinoflagellate. And this one is a single cell. It has flagella. And some dinoflagellates, they're part of that group of phytoplankton that photosynthesize. They're actually kind of a unique group because they can also eat other dinoflagellates, but for the most part, they photosynthesize. And we've been seeing a shifting baseline here in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary where say 20 years ago, we didn't see as many dinoflagellates. And we don't know, we certainly don't know whether or not that it's a changing environment enough. Um, so it's really important that we monitor plankton out in the sanctuary. To the left of this serratium, looks like it's another phytoplankton. And this is, it's called Rhizoslinia, and it's one long cell, and you'll see them sometimes dividing lengthwise. They just divide and divide. So when we have those phytoplankton blooms, literally it can be very patchy on the order of meters to miles. And those phytoplankton blooms can sometimes be harmful and sometimes not. If it's a harmful algal bloom, it can be something toxic. So I don't know if there's any, um, the Ketoceros down in the lower left here. I don't know, Morgan, if you, yeah. Uh, with the spines, we've had a lot of Ketoceros in the water. This curly Q, oops. All right, I'm going to try to get away from all these zooplankton so we can. Those zooplankton are pesky, but they're the ones that are feeding. They're feeding on the phytoplankton. Um, you can see this ketoceros right here that Morgan's pointing out. They have spines, and sometimes if there's a ketoceros bloom, it's so thick that it can clog the gills of fish. Oh, and that beautiful uh, protoperidinium. Uh, earlier we were looking at it and you could see the red spots inside. I just read that those spots are oil droplets that uh, have the red pigment. I didn't realize that. That's a dinoflagellate, right, Jane? And yeah, it's... you can see that girdle right there. And then those two little, two little legs sticking up. <laughs> I wonder, Morgan, if we can flip over to uh, bright light mm -hmm. or light field, hard. sorry. Yep. So she was, uh, Morgan is a an amazing uh, microscopist. And uh, so she's able to show the dark field that you can see behind her. Those are photos that she took of the uh, um, bioluminescent uh, sometimes uh, dinoflagellate. I'm going to zoom out a bit so we can get a better view of everything here. Oh, yeah. Now you can see that color better. That's true, Lise. How many drops is that, Morgan? How much in that slide? Uh, just two little drops of water. That's two little pipette drops? Yes. Couples, yeah. So that's, 
that's pretty incredible. This is sort of the more, you can really see the colors now of what the plankton's eating. And you can, the zooplankton sure are dominating the field um, here. So you can see um, the black eyes. I don't know, Morgan, if you can point out on that large polychaete larvae, you can see the two eyes there and then the palps that kind of look like bunny ears are what will become the tentacles. It's a what's called a spionid polychaete. So usually uh, if you are looking on the rocks uh, intertidally or if you're a diver, snorkeler, and you see a tube with just two little tentacles sticking out, um, that is what this will become. It will settle down into the substrate and form a tube and then it'll have two long uh, tentacles um, and then feed on tiny little plankton. Wondering, Morgan, if you could zoom in on that pseudonitsia. So we have monitors that are out uh, collecting plankton at a variety of sites along the coast. And one of the one of the key species or one of the HABs or the harmful algal blooms is Pseudonitsia, and it harbors a toxin. It wasn't in the early 90s we determined which species it was, but I don't know if everyone, anyone had heard the story, but Alfred Hitchcock used to come out to uh, from Capitola. He lived in Scotts Valley, and one day he came out to Capitola, and all these sooty shearwaters were walking around on the ground, you know, this is a seabird acting drunk, running into each other. And what had happened is that they had been out eating the fish that had been eating the copepods that had been eating the phytoplankton. And as that uh, toxin moves up through the food web, it biomagnifies. And so a lot of times we have shellfish closures or things usually one of the culprits one of the harmful algal blooms is this pseudonitsia looks like we're out of time but i just we wanted to give you a little taste of what is going out on right now out in the monterey bay national marine sanctuary and um, i want to let everyone know that cabrillo college has a course where if you're ever interested in monitoring plankton we really rely on you volunteers and everyone um, can get out there and monitor plankton we have a no fee no credit course that you can take to learn and all it's so much fun we just get to look at plankton and it's a great way to learn how to identify plankton and keep your eyes and ears on our protected areas Yeah, I had put that in the chat about the uh, Cabrillo College. So if folks are interested in the fall, it is a, uh, you do need to sign up to be a, uh, a student, but you don't have to pay for the class. So it's really fun. You can ask Martha Nitzberg. She's in the class. <laughs> a few of our- Thank you for sharing that plankton with us. And it looks like we have uh looks like we have one question uh left in the Q and A and it's has there been discussion about the future of ocean mining and what it means for the ocean? Sarah, did you want to take that or you want me to? <laughs> I think the sanctuaries kind of deal with that a little bit more than the yeah. department. Um <laughs> We but I can have, back you up if you need it, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, no, there hasn't been um, much. We we haven't had a discussion in recent years. I know there's been some talk about future mining. In fact, that was one of the big troublesome issues due to uh, there was some thought that in the last administration that they would be taking away protections, sanctuary protections. Um, it's very hard to undo sanctuaries uh, because they're congressionally, you know, approved. And so 
in terms of ocean mining, there hasn't been any discussion. I could send you some resources if you'd like, Harriet. Um, let me know if you'd like that. It hasn't been a, a, a threat currently. People are coming in with a couple of more questions. I know that some of our presenters have offered to stay past the eight o'clock mark, um, but I will say that for those of you who needed to leave at eight o'clock, uh, you have. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining us, and look for an email because we will be asking for your feedback and sending out a survey about all three of the DVS enrichments. If you'd like to hang on, um, I think that our presenters, some of them will uh, stay on and answer some questions. And we will be offering a recording of this whole event uh, for all of you in the future if you didn't or your friends didn't get a chance to see it. Ashley, I have a couple more questions come in. Yeah, there's one question in the chat. Um, when we swim, should we worry about all those plankton? No, um, you shouldn't worry. You should worry more about microplastics, which we didn't even get to talk about today. Our samplers and monitors are seeing microplastics in just about every sample and uh, it's pervasive. There's been a couple research papers that have come out just recently showing that plankton is making its way all the way down into our deep submarine canyon to the deepest steps, and they're finding it in every organism. Even plankton have had microplastics in it, things like copepods. So um, we should be more worried about what we're doing on our end to get rid of plastics and our behavior, you know, when we're going, just try to alleviate and not buy plastic things as much as possible into the future. Because we're pretty, pretty much inundated with plastics. It's a world ocean problem. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, another question, has there been a significant change in plankton in the bay over, over time? No, but there has been different trends. So plankton is very seasonal. We have, you know, plankton like right now during the upwelling season, we'll see the most kinds of plankton. We'll see the most abundant productivity. And the change that we've seen is like a shifting from one type of diatom to another, where maybe 10 years ago that wasn't the case. So again, this is the importance of long-term monitoring and looking at plankton over time, because IOS tell our plankton monitors, this is in 30, in 20 years, <laughs> you know, when I'm retired, um, you're going to people, we want people to be able to look back and go, wow, you know, this plankton was here. And then all of a sudden, no, wow, look, look what plankton's here. Is that due to ocean warming? Is that due to ocean acidification? Our plankton monitors don't just take plankton when they're monitoring. They also look at different organisms that are around. They look at water color. They look at salinity. They look at water temperature. There's a bunch of data that's being taken so that we can sort of monitor what's going on in the condition here in Monterey Bay. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question perfectly, but there has been no significant change just in the species. But I don't think we fully understand what the ramifications are. Jane, has there been in zooplankton? Well, I was just going to say that there's definitely a list of about 10 intertidal organisms yeah. that have moved from the south to the north, and yeah. so their plankton is no longer in our waters. It is now to the north of us because of the one degree water temperature warming. And, and aren't there more tintinids? Yeah, 
Morton yeah. Tenants, which we didn't have a chance to see. They were in there, but they're really tiny little uh, ciliates that are gorgeous. Yeah, these tin tenants are kind of replacing copepods as a main food source. But it's hard to know, you know, there hasn't been enough research on plankton. You know, it's one of those kind of unseen things and not studied as well as it could be. Yeah, the Cabrillo class really affords um, projects like this to happen because they're going out and they're monitoring plankton on a regular basis and you can go out as much as you want to or as little. Someone asked, will bioluminescent blooms happen again? Yes, I think so. Absolutely. And we have one more question from the Q&A. Um, a couple of years ago in Half Moon Bay, the commercial crabbing had to be stopped. Um, was that because of harmful plankton blooms? Yes, they, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, no, I, I was going to just say, um, and it was, it was more widespread than just Half Moon Bay, but um, the plankton experts can kind of pipe into this, but it was sort of a combination of things that the department had to work really closely with the commercial crab fishermen to um, decide to make that closure based on the plankton blooms and then shifting the season later in the year actually overlaps them more so with the whale migration and the whale feeding grounds. So that's when the entanglements became an issue. So that's why I just wanted to mention kind of the multiple factors that were involved in those closures. Okay, looks like that's all the questions that we have. And so I want to thank all of our speakers today for joining us here tonight and for bringing alive our Monterey Bay. And thank you to all of the people tuning in tonight. And like Julie said, be on the lookout for that survey and hope everybody has a good night. Thank you Thanks, so much. everyone. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks, Morgan. Loved your sample. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Morgan. Yeah, thanks, so good Ashley. to see you all.